Okay, class, uh, we'll get started. Uh, so we have talked about gradient descent method. So what is gradient descent method? Okay, where dk is minus some positive definite matrix multiplied by gradient of fxk. And in the previous lecture, we talked about different ways of computing alpha k or, or identifying the right choice of alpha k and the right choice for dk, depending upon the problem you have. So if you have very high dimensional problem, you want to avoid using Newton's method. If you have a low dimensional problem and you're using a microcontroller, you can perhaps execute Newton's method, uh, but you have to pick an appropriate step size. Uh, if you are, if your uh, data is distributed over a very large set of computers, you don't want to use Armijo's rules for picking alpha k because that requires a lot of function evaluations. So we understood some of these trade-offs that are inherent in picking the right choice of optimization algorithm or right choice of gradient descent method for your problem. Now in today's class, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the convergence properties of some of these algorithms that we have studied. We are not going to cover all the algorithms and all the edge cases for the algorithms. I'm just going to give you some broad description of the convergence property. And if you're interested in the proof or if you're interested in Understanding it better, definitely take a look at the book. And the book has, I don't know, like 15 or 20 different results on convergence schemes for gradient, uh, on uh, identifying the convergence properties of gradient descent algorithms. We are not going to go into all of that. So let's try to think about under what conditions this converges and to what kind of point would gradient descent algorithm converge. So without thinking about it, uh, or, or let's, let's try to understand. So I know that my dk is positive definite at all times. And assume, for the sake of argument, that my algorithm converges. So I have picked my alpha k and dk in such a fashion that xk converges to some x bar. What do you think is the property that would be satisfied at that x bar? So if xk converges to x bar, then what property is satisfied by x bar? What do you think? Why, why would you say that the gradient be equal to 0? Right. Uh, so, so this must be equal to zero, right? So this is x bar, this is x bar, then this must be equal to zero. I know that alpha k is positive. I know that dk is positive definite. So it must be that the gradient of f x bar must be equal to zero. Right? So this is, of course, a fact. So if my xk converges to x bar, then that particular point must satisfy gradient of f x bar equal to 0. I'm of course assuming here that my alpha k is greater than 0 and my dk is positive definite for all k and alpha k is not going to 0 and dk is not going to 0. So I'm assuming a lot of conditions. I'm assuming a lot of implicit, I'm making a lot of implicit assumptions here that my step size is not going to zero. My DK positive definite matrix is not going to zero. And at every point of time, they are going to be positive and positive definite respectively. Under all these assumptions, so many hypotheses, it's quite clear that if I'm converging, then the gradient must be equal to zero at that point. What does it mean for a gradient to be equal to zero at a point? What, what 
assumption, what, uh, can, what properties would that point have in terms of the optimization problem that we have at hand? Sorry? It's not changing? Right, so what kind of condition does it satisfy? Necessary. First order necessary condition, right? So this satisfies first order necessary conditions. So can we say something about the optimality of this point? Sorry? Second derivative? Right, so, but we don't have any second derivative information here, right? We, we don't know what the second derivative looks like. All we know is that if algorithm is converging, the first derivative is going to zero. So it only satisfies, so if your gradient descent algorithm converges, the point it converges to only satisfies the first order necessary condition for optimality, and therefore it's a candidate optimal solution, but not the optimal solution, right? And in order to certify that it is an optimal solution, what do you have to do? How do you certify that x bar is an optimal solution? Take the second derivative, right? So to certify to certify optimality, we must check the second derivative must be greater than zero, or, or, or second derivative must be positive definite. How many of you have run optimization algorithms before in some course project or, or some research project or something? Okay, a few. Did you check this condition after your optimization terminated? Sorry? Oh, you were not doing on continuous functions? Okay, <laughs> too bad. <laughs> okay, well, you know, the, the, the optimization over discrete variables is a very complicated topic, so I'm kind of very happy that you're already way ahead in the game. No? <laughs> okay, he's not ahead in the game. Uh, okay, good. Uh, so, so, you know, typically, when, you are, when I see papers and stuff, uh, I don't really see, so people claim that their algorithm converts to some optimal solution, but I have seldom seen this claim that the second derivative, they have checked that the second derivative is positive, and therefore they are claiming optimality. All they say is, okay, my algorithm converged, therefore it must be optimal. But you know, in reality it is, it is wrong to claim optimality just because your algorithm converged because the point it converges to only satisfies first order necessary condition for optimality. Now, of course, the situation changes if the function f is convex. Because if the function f is convex and your algorithm converged, then what do we know? We, we know that x bar is optimal solution because this is the sufficient condition for optimality for convex functions f. Okay, so in the convex case, if f is convex, uh, x bar is optimal. We don't have to check for anything else. In a convex case, if my optimization terminates, that's it, I'm, I'm in good shape. I'm, I'm at the optimal point. Yes, please. Correct. So, is that not optimality? so this is local optimality, not global. So in that case, you had to check for the infinity case to certify that it's a globally optimal solution, not a locally optimal solution, right? So this was, let me write it, this certify local optimality. So whenever in this class we talk about optimality, we are talking about local optimality in the context of non-convex function and of course global optimality in the case of convex functions. It's extremely difficult, extremely, extremely, extremely difficult to certify global optimality in the non-convex case, unless your function has very cool properties, which most functions don't have. 
<coughs> Any other question? Okay. So this is this is the stuff that we could deduce just by looking at the expression. Okay, we didn't have to really do a lot of mathematical mumbo jumbo. Let's try to understand what the theory says. So in order to understand the theory, we need to understand a uh, definition. DK is gradient related to X. So there is some condition called gradient related, DK being gradient related to X. DK is gradient related to XK if and only if. So this is a definition. So that's why I'm putting if and only if. For every XK, For every sequence xk that converges to x bar and gradient of fx bar is not equal to 0, the corresponding dk satisfies dk doesn't equal to 0. Oh, dk is bounded. So, satisfies dk is bounded. And so, we don't want my dk to escape to infinity if I'm converging to a non-stationary point. Lim sup k goes to infinity gradient of fxk transpose dk is less than zero. Okay, let's unpack this definition a little bit. So I'm picking a sequence xk. So remember dk is a function of xk, right? So once you pick a sequence xk, you also pick a sequence dk. But it's not just a function of xk. There is a dk, capital DK involved here, and then a capital alpha k. In, well, alpha k is not involved here. In the definition for dk, only capital DK is involved. Okay, so I have a sequence, I pick a sequence xk that converges to a non-stationary point. Non-stationarity means the gradient of f at x bar is not equal to zero. So the limit of the sequence that I have picked, I have picked that sequence, okay? I can pick any sequence in the space. And I pick a sequence which converges to a non-stationary point. Then the corresponding dk is bounded so it's not like dk is going to infinity. dk is bounded. Moreover, if I look at the limit superior, supremum, sorry, limit supremum of uh, gradient of fxk transpose dk, then it must be negative, which means that the derivative transpose dk must be less than zero for k sufficiently large. 
So if I pick large values of k, if I look at the tail of the sequence, it must be below the zero line. So it should look something like this. How, where should I draw it? Let me draw it on this side. This is my k, this is my gradient xk transpose dk. This is of course the origin. These are various values of k. And I'm plotting this gradient transpose dk And it, uh, it is all below, below the axis, x-axis, throughout, all the way to infinity, strictly below the x-axis. And moreover, the limit must be, there has to be some distance between the tail of the sequence and the zero, the x-axis, the zero z gradient of fxk transpose dk equals to zero line. This is the meaning of limb soup being strictly less than zero. Yes. Right, but dk could go to zero. Let's consider right. So my dk could be going to zero because my second derivative may be unbounded around that point. Right? So my dk could be going to zero. And I'm trying to avoid all those edge cases where things are blowing up as you get to a non-stationary point, x bar, in the space. OK? There are a lot of continuous functions where you, go, you take a limit and things start blowing up. Like the simplest example is 1 over x. Right, so if your xk is 1 over k, then xk converges to 0, but 1 over xk converges to infinity. Right, so, so I can pick this sequence which is converging to a non stationary point, but then I don't want some of the stuff to start going to infinity. So, what can go to infinity? Either the second derivative can go to infinity, in which case dk will go to 0, or this norm of dk itself is going to infinity, and then things become unbounded. So I, don't, I want to avoid all those edge conditions by just making that definition. Now, if you have a problem where this condition is not satisfied, you are just plain out of luck. Okay you will have a hard time trying to optimize that, that uh, trying to solve that problem. OK, so let's, so we, we, we had deduced this without necessarily making all this gradient related assumption, but with make, by making some of the other assumptions that were pretty strong. Now let's look at by making the assumption that dk is gradient related to xk, what kind of result can we prove? So xk, uh, this is a Proposition 1.2.1 in the book. So this xk is generated through the gradient descent process. dk is gradient related.
alpha k comes from minimization rule, limited minimization rule, and uh, or Armijo's rule. Then, if xk converges to x bar, then gradient of fx bar is equal to zero. Okay, any, yes, please. I, I'm confused how decaying the gradient related if the gradient is going to zero. Yeah, so sorry, what was the question? De how can dk be gradient related to xk? If xk is going to x bar and the gradient of x bar is equal to zero. Right, so the definition says if xk is converging to x bar, which is a non stationary point, then dk has to be gradient related. So if xk is converging to a stationary point, then this condition will not be satisfied. Does that make sense? No? Um, no, this is the definition of gradient relatedness. This, this is not a statement, this is a definition. So what I'm saying is if dk is gradient related to xk, then any sequence, for every sequence, that converges to a non-stationary point, this condition must be satisfied. If the condition, if the sequence doesn't converge to a, it converges to a stationary point, this condition need not be satisfied. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's the, this is the important part here. I'm only looking at a sequence which converges to a non-stationary point, then this condition must be satisfied. If it converges to a stationary point, I don't care what dk satisfies. So in this case, we have dk gradient related to xk. I'm picking alpha k according to minimization rule, limited minimization rule, or Armijo's rule. I can pick any one of these three rules for getting alpha k. If my gradient descent algorithm converges, then the point to which it converged must satisfy the stationarity condition must have the gradient equal to zero. And as we have just talked about, just because the gradient is equal to zero doesn't mean we are at the optimal solution. It only means that it is a candidate for an optimal solution. I still need to check the second order condition, sufficient condition, which is the second derivative of f at x bar e greater than zero in order to ascertain that I am standing at a local minimum. This one doesn't guarantee that you are at the local minimum. One of the assignment problems in assignment two would be to apply the gradient descent algorithm to uh, x cube, f, minimize fx equal to x cube. And if you start from a positive number between zero and one, your gradient descent algorithm will converge to zero. But we know that for zero is not a station, I mean it's a stationary point for x cube, but it's not an optimal solution to minimization of x cube. It just illustrates that because gradient descent converge means nothing, okay? It just means you converge to a stationary point. 
Okay, now there are a bunch of other results also in the book about constant step size and about Newton's method. So I just want to talk a little bit about Newton's method, what kind of convergence Newton method has. So in Newton's method, without going into too much technical detail, there is a whole bunch of assumptions which are there in the book, it implies that limit k goes to infinity xk plus 1 minus x bar over xk minus x bar, this is equal to 0. This is known as superlinear convergence. Okay, so in Newton's method, so let me tell you what this means, what does superlinear convergence mean? This is my k, this is my xk minus x bar, uh, some norm, whatever you want to pick. And if you look at the gradient descent method, this graph is going to look something like this, with a constant step size. If, you, if it is converging with a constant step size, you will see that the error, xk minus x bar, is actually decaying exponentially fast to zero. So let me write it. This is linear convergence. And exponential decay. in error, where error is defined as xk minus x bar, some norm of xk minus x bar. Okay, the, the reason why we call it linear convergence is because if you take the log of xk minus x bar, it looks like a linear, linear plot. So that's linear convergence, but what this is saying, what Newton's method, what happens in the Newton's method is that this ratio itself is going to zero very fast. What that means is the convergence looks something like this. This is Newton's method. It's no longer exponential, but it's, uh, it's super linear. It, 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 if you look at the log of xk minus x bar versus k, what you see is not a linear curve, but something that decays very quickly. So that's why it's called superlinear convergence, and Newton's method converges extremely fast to the optimal point. Uh, could you repeat why we are calling it linear convergence? Uh, yeah, so if you take the log of, where should I write? Okay, let me do it. Uh, okay, let me do it here. If I take log of xk minus x bar, it looks like this. Okay, that's why it's called linear. This is natural log, but you know you can take any any log. Uh, but typically when, when we talk about log, we are talking about natural log in this class. So that's why it's called, this is gradient descent, this is the same as this method. So I'm taking, here I'm displaying xk minus x bar, here I'm displaying log of xk minus x bar. And so in the log graph, you see that there is a linear relationship between the log of error and k, and that's why it's called linear convergence. 
In the original space, xk minus x bar, this would look like an exponentially decaying term error. And in the case of Newton's method, this would look like this. So you are converging very fast. It's super linear. OK. So why wouldn't you want to use Newton's method all the time? What stops you? Now that we know Newton's method converges super linearly, why wouldn't we want to use Newton's method all the time? If x bar is zero, then this will be uh, No, because this is saying that under certain assumptions, this is always equal to zero. So the limit is not the problem. We had discussed this in the previous class. What does Newton's method require? Yes, please. You have to invert a matrix, which could be really costly to do. Right. So you have to compute the second derivative, and then you have to invert it. Computing the second derivative is a costly operation. Could be a costly operation. So, so if I am writing a gradient descent code, and I have a 10 cross 10 matrix, sorry, I have a 10 dimensional vector, then in order to compute the second derivative by hand, I'll have to write 100 line of equations in my code. So I have to compute those equations, and then I have to write them in the code. It's a complicated, uh, time-consuming process. On the other hand, if I use a numeric differentiation method for computing the second derivative, then again, it's a time-consuming process, because you have to do a lot of function evaluation. So computing the second derivative and then inverting it is a time-consuming process, and therefore, People don't want to use Newton's method. However, if you have a three-dimensional, four-dimensional, or five-dimensional problem, and you are willing to do, write the code for second derivative of the function, I would highly recommend that you use Newton's method with an appropriate step size selection rule, because you will converge really fast to the optimal solution. But then you have to spend some time writing the code for computing the second derivative and inverting that matrix. Nowadays, of course, the optimization are being performed either on embedded devices, which is like a smart, smart thermostat, or it could be some small microcontroller in a vehicle, or you are computing optimization of like a billion dimensional optimization problem, say neural network or, or natural language processing, uh, neural networks for NLP applications. So in those cases, there's just no hope of computing second derivative and inverting it. So you just uh, that's a hopeless process, so you just skip that part completely. OK. Any questions so far before we move on to the next topic? Is it x bar also a problem in this case? Here? Yes. Knowing x bar yes. is a problem. Knowing x bar? Yeah, I mean, we don't know x bar uh, if you're writing a program and you're finding out where the solution will reach. Right. So you don't know x bar yet. You don't know x bar yet, but this condition will always be satisfied. So we don't know x bar, but my algorithm would converge to some point. But whatever point it will converge to, it will go there extremely fast. OK? So that's what this is saying. Uh, of course, you could have a very bad step size selection rule, in which case you will escape to infinity. We are not considering those cases here. Because our implicit assumption is xk converges to x bar. Then what happens? Okay? So the first thing that happens is you converge to a stationary point. And in the case of Newton's method, you converge to that point very, very fast. Okay? That's what this second statement is saying. Any other question while I erase the board? No questions. So now, next topic is uh, Gauss-Newton method, which is used to solve least square problem. We are going to talk about very specialized gradient descent algorithms now. 
for unconstrained optimization and for very specific settings. So let's uh, dive into it. So what's my goal here? I have a function g of x, g1 of x, gm of x. And I want to minimize. So this is a function. g is a function from rn to rm. And I want to solve the following problem. I want to minimize f of x which is also this is the two norm. Let me write it explicitly. This is known as least square problem. Least square problem. This kind of problem is typically encountered when you are training neural networks, when you are doing system identification, when you are minimizing some sort of error. Uh, uh, which is of course frequently used in uh, machine learning type problems. Uh, where else do we use it? Uh, we use it in hypothesis testing and uh, curve fitting. Curve fitting is used in statistics for fitting like if you have a bunch of data points you want to fit a curve. So in all those situations in statistics controls for system identification in a machine learning for neural network training, this type of problem arises quite frequently. So this is the problem that's given to us. And what we want to do is come up with a gradient descent algorithm, a lightweight gradient descent algorithm to solve this problem. What would the steepest descent look like for this problem? Okay. So in order to compute steepest descent, I need to differentiate this function. I need to find what the derivative of fx is. Can someone help me compute this derivative of the function fx? Let's look at this expression. Let's look at this expression. What's the derivative of this expression with respect to x? Who wants to try? One to M and then GI of X gradient GI of X, right? Can I write it in matrix format? So I, in the matrix format, I'm going to write it as gradient of g of x times g of x. Let's do a sanity check. This is a vector in Rn. This is a vector in, uh, I'm sorry, a matrix in Rn cross m. And this is Rm cross 1. So the dimensionally, this equation looks correct. And it's actually correct. It, it's not just dimensionally correct. It is actually correct expression for gradient of fx. OK. 
So in order to compute the gradient of fx for steepest descent, I need to compute the gradient of g, and I need to multiply it with g in order to get the gradient, right? And then I can run the vanilla gradient descent method. Let's try to solve, let's try to compute the second derivative of fx, okay? Let's try to be a bit more smart. And we just talked about Newton's method and how cool that method is. So let's try and apply the Newton method, Newton's method idea to this particular problem. So think about what the second derivative of the function f would look like. <clears throat> What's the second derivative of f at x? So remember, when you have two multiplication, uh, you compute the derivative with respect to the first one, keep the second one, and then you keep the first one and take the derivative with respect to the second term. So we'll do the same thing, and what I get is transpose plus plus I can again write it in the vector format, gradient of gx, gradient of gx transpose plus summation gi, second derivative of gi, i equals 1 to m. Okay. So here is the setting. Let's start thinking like an optimizer now. Here is the setting. We were given a least square problem to solve. In order to solve that problem, I need to apply gradient descent method, in which case I have to compute, like I'm, I'm forced to compute the first derivative of the function. I cannot get around it. And so I computed the first derivative of the function, and in order to compute that, I need to compute this term, and I need to compute this vector, okay? I just have to compute it. Now, I want to be smart. I have known a lot of good things. I have heard a lot of good things about Newton's method. And it turns out that I can actually compute the second derivative somewhat easily, at least in theory. I can compute the second derivative. And when I compute the second derivative, I see something very cool in this problem. What's the cool thing here? So this is a matrix that I've already computed while computing the gradient. And it looks like that matrix is needed for computing the second derivative. So I don't really have to spend a little, any extra effort for computing this part. It's already computed because I, I know what that matrix is, so I can just do the matrix multiplication. This term, on the other hand, requires further effort. I need to spend some more time trying to compute this particular matrix. So some effort is needed. And we just discussed in the previous, uh, in like 10 minutes ago, that computing the second derivative of a high dimensional a function of high dimension is not a fun thing to do. Nobody wants to do that. You, you have already spent time con computing the first derivative. Now the question is, should we invest extra effort in computing the second derivative? Right? So that's the question we are thinking about. And we are optimizers. We have taken this optimization class. 
what do you think we should do if we want to apply Newton's method, but we don't want to put in the effort for computing the second derivative? What do you think we should do? Any thoughts? What can we do? I want a simple life. I don't want my, com my life to be complicated. How can I simplify my life and still enjoy the properties of Newton's method? Yes, please. Can we use an approximation? Can we use an approximation for this term? So what approximation would you like to use? You're not sure? OK, yes. Assume it's zero. Just set it equal to 0. I'm just going to ignore that term, OK? I'm going to ignore that term, and I'm going to pick my dk to be negative, negative Let me put xk I'm going to set the second term to be equal to 0. I don't want to put in that kind of effort. So let's just approximate it with 0 and move forward with our iteration. And this is Gauss-Newton's method, OK? This is Gauss-Newton's method. Yes, please. What are the dimensions of GI and GI squared? So GI is a GI maps Rn to R. So GI is basically just a real number. And the second derivative. Rn to Rn cross n. Okay. So what is appealing in this particular algorithm is we get the speed up of Newton's method because we are having some approximation of the second derivative, not the complete second derivative, but just some approximation of second derivative. I can invert that. And then I can, I've already computed my gradient of g multiplied by g as part of my gradient computation. I'm just using that method to improve the convergence speed. And this is very, very, very good because uh, doing this matrix multiplication and inversion may not be that complicated for a small dimensional problem. It could become complicated for very high dimensional problem, but not that complicated for 10 cross 10 or 15 cross 15 matrix. Or even a 100 cross 100 matrix, it's not a problem. What is the problem with this method? So you started running this algorithm and then something happened. What could go wrong? What's the requirement for this matrix here? Right. So this must be positive definite. Now you see, this is matrix, matrix transpose. So it is positive semi-definite for sure. OK? It's positive semi-definite for sure. So under what condition would this be positive definite matrix? Symmetric? No, this is already symmetric because it's AA transpose. So the question is, when is AA transpose? So AA transpose is positive semi-definite, for sure. When is AA transpose positive definite? So A is a n cross m, so you can't really talk about eigenvalues. Gradient is great, no, gradient, no. Okay, so fun fact, so if, if, M is greater than N, and A is full rank, 
well, A is in R n cross m. m is greater than n, A is full rank. Then A, A transpose is positive definite. I don't expect you to know, but this is something that, that's a nice result in uh, matrix theory. So you take a, f you, if you have a full rank matrix where you have more number of columns than the number of rows, then A transpose has to be positive definite matrix. Fun fact. So if your gradient of G is a full rank matrix and M is much larger than N, then this term is automatically positive definite by construction. And your algorithm will work flawlessly, no problems. Now what if at some point in the space, so you are running this optimization, you are going over all, you are going to all over the space. What, at, what, if, what if at some point this is, this becomes uh, positive semi-definite, which means that some of the eigenvalues are approaching zero, or they are close to zero, or they are already zero, then we have a problem. Then it's no longer a positive definite matrix. Then what do we do? So we are running this algorithm. Everything is fine in the beginning. And after a thousand iterations, I come to realize that, hey, look, the gradient of G is no longer a full rank matrix, or this G, G, gradient G, gradient G transpose is having some eigenvalue issues. The eigenvalues are going to zero. What can we do? Uh, you are right. We want to add a small epsilon, but it has to, that small epsilon has to be multiplied to something. Okay, identity. identity matrix. Okay. So that is the Levenberg What you do is, this matrix is becoming singular for some reason. Then you add some small positive definite matrix, and then take the inverse. This would be your dk. So this delta k is a small positive definite matrix. So you could pick delta k. 0 0.5 times identity matrix, or whatever, 0 0.1 times identity matrix. So in this case, you make sure that your DK is always going to be positive definite. Any questions so far? We have about two minutes. Yes, please. Why, why was it okay to neglect that term? Why is it okay? Oh, that was my next question. Okay. Under what conditions can we, can this become exact Newton's method? When, when would this become exact Newton's method, this one? When will it become exact Newton's method? When this is equal to zero, right? Then it's an exact Newton's method. When is this equal to zero? When the second derivative, when the second derivative is zero. When is the second derivative zero? Remember, gi is a function from Rn to R. So when is the second derivative of such a function zero? When gi is linear, it's a linear function. Then it has a slope, but it doesn't have a, a, a curvature. Okay, it has a slope, but no curvature. So the second derivative is zero. So when GI is a linear function, which is the case in what is known as linear regression, anyone has heard of linear regression before? Right, so a lot of people do linear regression day in and day out. It's a very uh, fundamental tool in statistics and machine learning. So in linear regression, this is exact Newton's method. 
Okay, this is not an approximate Newton's method. This is exact. But of course, in some cases, your GI may have small curvature, in which case this is an approximate Newton's method. And if your GI has very large curvature, then this is far away from Newton's method. But still, it has some of the benefits of Newton's method, which is it converges faster than just the vanilla gradient descent method. Okay. So that's the benefit of Gauss-Newton's method for solving, uh, uh, for solving the, the problem, uh, least square problem. Okay, so that's all I have for today's class. We are going to talk about conjugate direction method in the next class and then subsequently approximate Newton's method. Thank you.